Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Brahim Aude. Immigration, undocumented students, and the UH. Uh, this is our topic for this evening, and uh, we have two guests with us. Carolina Torres, who's an ethnic studies major at UH Manoa. Welcome to Island Connections. And Ruben Campos, he's a graduate student in anthropology also at UH Manoa. Thank you for coming. Uh, so before we start uh, with the uh, program, and we have uh, uh, interviewed a number of uh, people as well, which will play segments of that, um, could you tell us something about uh, yourself, Carolina, and uh, how you became interested in this topic? Hi, everyone. My name is Carolina. Um, I was born in Peru. Uh, my parents immigrated to America when I was seven years old. We came to this country undocumented. So I know the struggles that a lot of undocumented, undocumented students face nowadays. That's why I decided to get into this. Um, so I am a third year student here at Manoa. Um, I'm a lead member of Hawaii, a Hawaii Alliance for Local Immigrant Voices and Empowerment, as well as um, the Club ESSA. And what we try to do is get UH to change its policy to allow undocumented students here at the university. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. And uh, when you say the Club ESSA, you're meaning like uh, the... Yeah. Ethnic Studies Students Association. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. And uh, Ruben, um, how, what's your connection? Um, so I, I came to... UH to get my um, doctorate in anthropology and spent a lot of time in the ethnic studies department. Um, met a lot of the professors there and really liked kind of the different side that um, that the academic field was, was doing. And um, so I had the opportunity to help out um, some pro professors that were working on this and it, it just seemed to fit and um, really enjoyed it. So. Mm -hmm. Good. So um, I have uh, interviewed uh, Amy Akbayani, um, who is the Director of uh, Students' uh, Equity, Excellence, and Diversity at uh, the University of Hawaii. And I asked her about her own experience and also about what she does in terms of uh, minority students and immigrant students. So we would listen to that, and then maybe we can discuss that. All right. Well, first of all, um, I'm really happy to have this opportunity to explain. And I'd like to start by saying my own personal experience. Um, I was born in the Philippines, and one of the first programs that I helped start here in Hawaii was called Operation Manong. And our f efforts there were to assist uh, immigrant children, undocumented or non uh, or legal uh, immigrants, uh, to, to do better in the public schools and also to get the public schools to be re more responsible for the children who were not native English speakers of uh, native English speakers. So for over 40 years I've been working with uh, uh, populations um, uh, who have been born in other countries and have made Hawaii their home. And as you know, um, uh, uh, our native Hawaiian population has been um, over the years, decades, uh, uh, welcoming and uh, working with um, uh, the people that are coming to Hawaii. And this is just, a, again, a part of our history. So um, that's what she has been doing over the years, actually, and beginning Operation Manong, and later on things developed that uh, the university have had that office or called SEED for Equity, Excellence, and Diversity. And so this is uh, an important uh, issue uh, for the um, UH as a whole. So would you uh, want to say something more about like how, uh, for instance, uh, uh, immigrant students uh, in, at Manoa, for instance, or in the system, UH system as well, um, if you had like relations with immigrant students and what were your experiences? A couple of undocumented students who are from Maui. Um, they went to high school over there and grew up here in Hawaii. Like this is all they know. And when the time comes for them to go to college to start applying, they realize that they can't because they don't have a social security number. So despite of the fact that they've been paying taxes and have been living in Hawaii their whole life, the university still doesn't give them affordable tuition. They charge them as out-of-state 
um, students, which is three times of what an uh, in-state resident would be paying, and they don't give them any financial aid. So um, what we're trying to do, just like how Amy did, is like grant these kids the opportunity to go to college to succeed in life. That's, that's good. So maybe um, uh, any comments on that, uh, Ruben? No, just no. it was nice to see Dr. No. Amy and yeah. Miami. Okay. <laughs> so what I um, uh, want to do is uh, um, another segment from Amy's uh, interview, because she talks about the specific thing that uh, you have uh, just mentioned, which is uh, the undocumented students. And it's like about th three minutes, and then we can discuss more stuff. The issue before us right now is uh, um, undocumented students, and and it started off really uh, with the uh, initiatives of President Obama uh, called the Dream Act, um, and nationally, the Dream Act would uh, provide um, undocumented students um, who fulfilled certain requirements to be able to attend college and have a pathway to citizenship. And it sort of got stuck in one of the in Congress, and it still um, can be um, uh, supported. And and I'm happy to say that our congressional delegation from Hawaii, um, for example, when Congressman Abercrombie was a congressman, he supported it, and now our current um, and it is still supported by uh, Senator Inoue, um, Senator Akaka. Congresswoman uh, Hirono and Congresswoman Hanabusa have actively said that they, and have expressed support for the DREAM Act. So in Hawaii, uh, we would like to have a, a Hawaii DREAM Act. And so some people, uh, including some of our good friends, uh, Representative Scott Saiki, Representative Roy Takumi, and Senator Jill Takuda, introduced um, legislation last session but it didn't get passed, and it's not because they didn't support it. In fact, they passed it at some, at some of these committees, but they felt that it is really a responsibility of the University of Hawaii. The University of Hawaii has the authority, the Board of Regents and the President have the authority to provide resident tuition for whatever groups they want. And so I'm happy to say that there is support at the University of Hawaii for this. Um, and. Um, Last, uh, on September 27th, uh, a group of us were at uh, the Senate, I mean, the Board of Regents Committee on Student Affairs, and we had um, three wonderful students uh, talk about themselves or their good friends who have been undocumented. And it, they were very moving statements. One of them was a Mexican, is Mexican, came as a two-year-old. His younger sister, of course, is legal because she was born here, but he didn't know that he was not um, a, a citizen or anything until he was applying for and got lots of scholarships and an excellent student. He finally figured out his life changed and he couldn't apply to these things. And his mother gave him the, that was uh, really very um, problematic for him and his family. And uh, so he um, has done very well and uh, is now committed to um, trying to help other uh, undocumented students to get support. Yeah, so um, Ruben, you want to comment uh, further on that uh, in terms of your activities and what you saw? Sure, absolutely. Um, she spoke a, a bit about the, um, the uh, Committee on Student Affairs, and I, I actually got to witness that. And it was a really exciting moment, I think, um, to, as she said, see so much campus support for it. Um, there was uh, quite, a, you know, quite a few there, Jeff Aceto, um, Baxa, I believe, um, who we're really excited to see this kind of um, liberal forward thinking um, action that was very student led. Um, and uh, it, it seems to be, you know, really coming together as and shifting towards a yeah. good thing. And uh, this um, issue, um, there's a background for this issue, of course. Uh, and uh, in terms of uh, research, uh, in terms of uh, what we teach our students as well, at the Department of Ethnic Studies, for instance. And uh, so I asked uh, Monisha Dasgupta, who's an associate professor at um, 
ethnic studies and women's studies, uh, to uh, ask her about uh, you know her own research and how she uh, looks at the question of immigration and also the question of undocumented as well. But um, we, it's important to first look at the immigration question and see where the undocumented fit uh, in it, and then why do we have this kind of action? Uh, so we would uh, go to a segment of Monisha's interview, and then we can uh, discuss more about it, uh, your own activities and your own ideas about that. My research is about immigration policy from a grassroots perspective, and uh, from 2006 onward, I was, uh, you know, sort of very interested in looking at the ways in which the debates on immigration reform were panning out in the nation. Uh, it was in that process that I was introduced to uh, undocumented youth as activists, you know, who were sort of pushing their, you know, own agendas in a movement that is dominated by, you know, many older uh, men and women. So if you remember when in 2006 there were uh, a couple of house bills up that was going, you know, that were going to turn immigrants into felons uh, for either crossing the border or for supporting people who were undocumented. Uh, it was there, there were massive walkouts by young people in high school, uh, and and that's I think how they got politicized because the kind of rhetoric we hear is that the youth is you know, very disenfranchised, uh, is uninvolved, unengaged. But I think for my, for immigrant youth, the story is very different. And uh, I think that over the years, since 2006, as I have watched the movement grow, uh, I have found that immigrant youth are, you know, the most radical <laughs> in some ways in terms of pushing the movement to more and more milit to take more and more militant actions. So, you know, right now what these young people are doing is coming out as undocumented, uh, in many ways challenging the very system that drives them underground. So, Karolina, what are your experiences, uh, especially through your activism? So you can see that this part um, has been student-led as well as faculty. Um, what we have been doing as students is going around um, each classroom and talking into in front of the classes and asking them to sign a petition. First, of course, we would tell them, you know, this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to help undocumented students, and please sign this petition supporting like our cause. And like the petitions would go around, and like every most of the time, everybody in the classroom would sign. A lot of people would have questions, and what I found most like most interesting was that at the end of class, some people would come up to me, the students, and they would tell me, "Oh, how can I get involved? Please, like, give me some papers." so I can pass around my own classes and talk to people about this. So what we see is that a lot of students support this. A lot of them want to get involved because they know it's important and they want to help out students, you know, come into our school. Let me ask you um, uh, kind of a personal question, but, uh, you know, pertinent to what we're talking about. Like you said you came to the United States as undocumented, mm -hmm. right? Uh, so what kind of difference uh, did you feel between being undocumented and now you are documented, shall we say. I mean, what did that uh, do for you? Um, I know when I was undocumented, I was much younger, but I would see my parents struggling all the time. We would always like have a hard time finding places to live. We would usually have to rent from one of his, like my dad's friends or something, and we would have to go live like in their basement or something because we could not get an apartment, we could not get a house. So once we received our social security card, we were able to finally get an apartment, a place of our own. We could buy a car. Um, when I was undocumented, we could not get any like Medicaid. Um, we were always without insurance, so we had to be very careful. But then once we got our social security number, I was I felt better because I knew that I could finally go to school, that I would not graduate from high school and like go straight into like a low paying job. I knew that I was able to go to college. So when you become documented, you realize that so many doors open for you, that you'll be better off in life. Yeah. And when you were undocumented, uh, your dad or, and your mom, if she was working, they were paying taxes and yeah, doing we, all of that? we would file taxes every end of the year. Um, we didn't have a social security number, but the IRS gives you um, 
an ID number that you can use to file your taxes. And even if we were to get money back, we would never get it because we didn't have a social security number. But we will always file our taxes at the end of the year. So we did pay taxes. Yes, yeah. thank you. Uh, any uh, comments in terms of your own experiences, um, having known perhaps undocumented people? Um, I, for me, I think it's mostly been uh, also just very exciting to see um, student engagement. And, and um, you know, I perhaps, because I, I went through my undergrad with not really connecting uh, with too much of any kind of movement or activism, I thought, you know, a lot of just students just don't care about you know, what's going on around them. But I think I've just I've complete, been completely surprised at how, how wrong I was and how um, students here on campus definitely care, definitely yeah. care. Yeah, very good. Uh, so Monisha, her other uh, segment of the interview, uh, talks about uh, her research on the Latino community and then in terms of Hawaii, yeah, because she did a good uh, project on that, very important project. So. We'll talk to her and then uh, we can comment more because you have a lot to say probably about uh, that. <laughs> it was actually a piece of research that was supported by the Ethnic Studies Department because one of the things that we do is try and learn about our communities and respond to the kinds of needs that we have in the uh, kind of needs that the community has. Uh, and what happened was that uh, we were hearing stories about uh, Latino immigrants being, um, you know, sort of put into deportation as they were flying in from the neighbor islands into Honolulu. Uh, you know, people like Claire Hanus, who doesn't practice here anymore, but was a fierce advocate of immigrants and a lawyer, uh, would you know, share these stories of distress with us. And uh, there were also other lawyer friends who alerted us to what was going on in terms of racial profiling. Uh, so we wanted to know, you know, why Latinos, who are they, what, you know, where are they on our islands because they're a very invisible community. And we went and basically did a very broad study that wasn't just focused on undocumented people, but we wanted to learn more about the Latino community right now uh, on our islands. And we did this research in Honolulu, Maui, and the Big Island. And what we found was that, you know, there was a big discrepancy between the actual demographic profile of Latinos in Hawaii uh, and, you know, the number of people who were being detained uh, and put into deportation for immigration infractions. So more than 84 percent of uh, Latinos in Hawaii are citizen. Um, and yet they are disproportionately targeted for immigration enforcement. And those were the stories that we were hearing and collecting as we went from island to island because people were uh, afraid to walk on the street uh, from, as they were walking back from work or taking their kids to school. Uh, they were afraid to report a crime to the police. Uh, they were feeling terrorized at work because people at work could expose them as being undocumented. So uh, we, you know, in doing this larger study about who Latinos are in our state, you know, uh, got those stories that the law, our lawyer friends were sharing with us confirmed. Uh, and I think that since then we have tried to work with the community in order to, uh, you know, sort of uh, address some of the biggest uh, problems which, uh, you know, arise from Im immigration enforcement in the community. Yeah, I mean, would you want to add to that or comment on it or your experiences regarding uh, dealing with other immigrants uh, need not be undocumented, but both documented and undocumented? Mm, I know there is discrimination, like, in when they're in high school, like, I see, like, um, the Mexican kids were always, um, they wouldn't hang out with all the other kids. And I don't, I'm not sure it's because like people like had this view of them or something. Mm -hmm. you no, know, so I think there, there is a uh, little discrimination against Latinos in Hawaii. Um, I know the DUI checkpoints, they would usually stop people because they look Mexican. So they're trying to check for their papers because they automatically assume that they're undocumented. Like, uh, would they stop uh, someone who looks Chinese, for instance, and, uh, you know, figure out, is he undocumented? Or well, well, what, 
what do you think, or did you hear of stories like that? Mm, I haven't heard of yeah. anyone who was Chinese who got stopped because of that, but I know it's most common like when it comes to Latinos because yeah. the, immediately people think, oh, Latino, okay. undocumented, came here without papers. Yeah. Yeah. You're an anthropologist, <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it's, um, <clears throat> I'm from Southern California, so uh, and I grew up in a very kind of, um, we're a, a place where the population of Mexicans, Mexican Americans, Mexican immigrants was just high. Mm -hmm. um, so when I came here, it was kind of, kind of very different. Um, where you know, and, and it's as silly as it is, I can't get the kind of food I like to eat. <laughs> but um, I think what's what's kind of scary is that um, we are kind of at this moment where we might be seeing a shift in um, kind of fear tactics in, in, in Hawaii and, and where different people can be targeted. And um, I think that's kind of a scary thing to realize that uh, you know, you're at the cusp of, but I think through actions like this and um, talking to different students in, in classes that um, you know, we're, we're understanding that we can change that. Yeah. Uh, a short clip uh, from Amy Agbayan is regarding the Supreme Court and the rule of the Supreme Court regarding undocumented mm -hmm. children. So we'll uh, watch that. This is a very short one. The Supreme Court has ruled that uh, undocumented children must be educated by the public schools. Mm -hmm. So here we're just saying we are continuing this um, philosophy, really, to say that uh, these people are um, have uh, uh, should be given this opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, so this is like, uh, that's the Supreme Court uh, stating that now, <clears throat> what does it mean? Does it mean like they have to pay, um, w w do they have to pay anything at all or just like free uh, in high school? But what about universities, etc.? That's mm -hmm. another topic. But we're trying to set the stage, uh, in fact, to discuss m in more detail the action before the Board of Regents and so forth, although we have alluded to it, uh, you know, in more ways uh, than one uh, few times uh, in, in this uh, program. But um, uh, we also uh, interviewed uh, Doray Sh uh, Shin, uh, who is a policy uh, major, political science major at the uh, uh, University of Hawaii. <laughs> I hope Ethnic Studies University. <laughs> uh, so we uh, will uh, uh, watch that and then we can go forward from there. Um, right now I'm a student at UH. Oh, I'm studying political science um, as an undergrad, and I'm originally from Pennsylvania. I was lucky enough to be born and raised there, um, but as as an immigrant, as a second generation immigrant, <laughs> um, I was introduced to the immigrant rights movement in California when I was um, interning at the age of 16 um, for the first time for a community organization called the Korean Resource Center based in Los Angeles. Um, there I learned about the DREAM Act, the Federal DREAM Act, as well as the California DREAM Act, and the importance of immigrant rights issues, especially for youth living in America. And I met a lot of people there, um, my age, older, younger, um, youth in general trying to get their education, who um, just trying to overcome all the obstacles in their way that um, didn't allow them to get that higher education and didn't allow them to receive any financial aid or um, get acceptance into schools or if, if they did get into schools they were not able to pursue anything with the degree that they had because of employment verification systems um, with their undocumented status. Yeah, I mean, that's uh, one. I um, uh, have um, another segment uh, for Dore and I think maybe we should uh, watch that now before we talk a little bit more about the DREAM Act because I think you both not only have heard uh, about the DREAM Act, but uh, you have some activity around that as well. And uh, we can move from there after we see uh, Doray's uh, second uh, segment. Um, I say most of them, they are all childhood arrivals. So they come here um, mostly with their parents. Um, some of them have no memories of their home country. 
Um, their first language is English for a lot of them, and even if they are not, this is the only country that they call home. Uh, many don't have family or don't know any of the family that live in their home countries, um, and they just wouldn't feel comfortable co going back to that place because they grow up in, um, in the States, whether it be California, Hawaii, um, anywhere. They, that's the place that they call home. Um, those are where they met their friends. That's where they went through elementary, middle school, and high school, and um, already contributed to the system in that way. Um, we're trying to give um, undocumented students uh, access to financial aid um, and in-state tuition in the UH system. Um, so these are students that have um, graduated from Hawaii high schools, have attended Hawaii high schools, um, people who, uh, who are just like every, all, everybody else. Um, these are students that uh, find out that they're not, um, they're not a citizen, um, maybe really late. Uh, sometimes their parents don't want to tell them um, the, this news that, of their status. And so when they're, off, when they're going off to college, um, they realize they, they, can't, they can't be like the other students. They, they can't go to college um, and, and pursue uh, their dreams. It's important to me because, like I said, uh, these students are, are just like me. Um, the only thing is that they don't have the, the documents to say um, that they have permission to be here. Um, but their story is really not um, different from mine. Yeah, this is uh, very important what uh, Paul Martin uh, said, who is also an ethnic studies major. And uh, he's uh, been pretty active uh, uh, around that uh, particular topic. Uh, so um, you mentioned also a few things like, you know, people uh, who have come when they are young, like one year or two years old and so on. So um, could you comment on what uh, Dore and Paul have said? Uh, so yeah, it is very true what they said that um, these kids come to this country very young. Um, it's without their consent because their parents are bringing them to this country for a better life. Um, they come here and they just grow up thinking that this is, you know, that they're just like everyone else. They can go to college, do all the things that their friends can. But then the time comes and they realize that they can't. And they're stuck in this place where they, like, don't know what to do. They end up going, you know, getting, going to places where they pay them really low wages. And, like, a lot of these students have, like, excelled in high school. Like, they have been in the honors programs. They have graduated with, um, with, um... Uh, well, I mean, you, you know, know, with, the um, High, uh, the grades. High, GPA, yeah, high GPA, yeah, high grades, yeah, yeah, and um, they are a resource and an asset uh, to the community and society. Yes. So why would you not want to utilize that particular resource and reward that resource? I mean, uh, you have ex uh, experiences uh, in in that regard through your activism as well. Yeah, I mean, I think um, what's what's really surprising with kind of the current policies is just the ways we are just kind of ignoring a completely, you know, a perfectly fine human group, you know, that are uh, very capable and, and active and, and uh, well-rounded, right? I mean, we, I don't want to turn, you know, immigrant peoples into um, just like human capital and just saying that, you know, they're, they can contribute and that's their real value. I mean, I think um, their real value is just themselves, right? And, and um, the kind of different lens and perspectives that you know they're, they're contributing to to where we're at and um, so yeah yeah so I mean uh, the contribution uh, is like uh, that would benefit everyone including the uh, right. undocumented and the documented yeah? Yeah. so I, I think uh, it's a very important uh, thing uh, to realize uh, that leads me to something else in fact which is uh, why all this kind of uh, rejection? I mean, uh, not uh, in American society uh, towards uh, immigrants uh, and uh, especially the undocumented. I mean, well, why do you think? I mean, from your ethnic studies courses and so. 
It's usually, I think, like a lot of people, their excuse is that these people don't pay taxes. They came to the country without going through the actual process, like the right process, you know. Um, but it's it's a common misconception that they don't pay taxes because they obviously do pay taxes, um, as we have here. Uh, in Hawaii in 2010, undocumented people actually contributed $50.6 million just in taxes. And so they do pay taxes, and I wish people would understand that. Another like um, common misconception is that they take advantage of the um, of the healthcare system, and that is not true. Um, I was looking at this st statistic um, after the 1986 Amnesty Act. Um, those who uh, finally received their documents, they, it shows up that less than one percent of those people who were undocumented actually use the health care system. Um, and they can't even take advantage of it because they don't have social security numbers that w would let them, you know, get into hospitals and get all those benefits. Yeah. Um, there was mention of the DREAM Act uh, as an important uh, transitional uh, program, for instance, which hasn't passed yet, uh, but uh, I mean, could you say something more about it? Uh, well, I think the DREAM Act is, is one of those kind of <clears throat> majorly important issues and shifts that, you know, we want to see happen in American politics, and um, again, it, it really comes down to um, America's conception of immigrant groups mm -hmm. and um, whether or not, you know, we, we're going to accept them or whether or not we're going to treat them um, fairly and equally. So um, in terms of education, um, the United States is you know, shifting in a, in a very big way and education is still just, just as valuable and just as important and it needs to be opened up to, to all of its you know, um, raised people. Um, I interviewed uh, also Paul Martin. Um, yeah, as we have seen before, but um, there's another segment because of what he mentioned uh, earlier and we just watched uh, was uh, really stri striking to me. So I wanted to figure out, uh, well, how did he arrive at uh, this kind of uh, activism and this kind of position that uh, led to his activism on the issue? So um, I um, asked him uh, a question about his background and what he did. So we'll watch that. Um, I'm part of the Ethnic Studies Student Association. Uh, what the Ethnic Studies Student Association tries to do is that we try to get our members to become uh, more uh, active um, in our community. Um, and we try to implement um, the ideas that we learn in the classroom um, in, in our lives. Um, and so I was asked by a Catalina um, Torres to, to to help um, with this policy change. Um, and one of the ways um, in which she asks ESSA to be a part of this is to actually be the, the main RIO um, for this cause. Yeah, uh, the RIO meaning uh, Registered Independent Organization. That's part of the Campus Center thing, which uh, encourages uh, students uh, through that uh, mechanism to be active in all kinds of uh, things, uh, social and academic and so forth. Uh, so um, uh, that's where, um, you know, Paul comes in, in terms of his activism, etc. But I want to go to another segment of uh, his interview, and uh, he mentions uh, more things that uh, they've been doing, and so we can discuss later. So there's three big things that we did uh, recently. Uh, the first thing that we had to do was try to um, get students on campus to support um, the UH policy change. Um, so we went into classrooms and we gave like a five minute spiel um, tell, asking for student support um, through student petitions. Um, and we actually got as much as 500 student signatures in total. Um, after that, that part was done, our, our next move was to, to convince the BOR um, to change the policy. Um, we did that around two weeks ago, and 
we were well received um, at the meeting. Um, we got the full support of everyone who was part of um, that committee. Um, and then the next step would be to go to, um, in, in November, would be the next step where the full BOR um, would be able to vote to actually change the policy. But um, before that next meeting in November, uh, Another thing we had to do was get the support of U ASUH, um, the, the undergraduate government, uh, student government, and we also got their support as well uh, about a week ago. So yeah, they've been active, yeah, <laughs> which is uh, that's the way to go. And you mentioned a few things uh, earlier uh, as to what, uh, similar to what Paul was talking about, but uh, what else? Uh, uh, are you doing now? I mean, are you doing more things now? Mm, well, what we're going to try to do is continue getting more signatures, ask the faculty members for their support letters to just keep bringing them in until the November um, 16, 17 meeting at the BOR in Maui. So we're just getting like as much support as we can so they know that we, like, you know, that everybody's like in support of this, that we really want this change to happen. Any of the students will be going to Maui? Um, so far we have myself and Duration who are going to go. Um, we, yeah, we're still um, deciding like, who else can go. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there, maybe you can get uh, people, uh, students from the Maui Community College, yes, for instance. That's what, yeah. that's what we're trying to do is yeah. get people from the Maui Dream Team to mm -hmm. like come and speak yeah. out as well because right. we need like personal stories of mm -hmm. kids who are still undocumented right, right now who really want to go to college. Especially uh, Maui, <coughs> the uh, immigrant community mm -hmm. there documented and undocumented was targeted. Uh, by like Homeland Security uh, and police action, Maui police action, etc. And that's the stereotyping part that you were talking about. You didn't call it stereotyping, but that's what it is. Everybody would know. We didn't have to mention that. But I'm just mentioning this to just like dig it in, you know, stereotyping. And this is something like in the 21st century we still do, and we still discriminate because of these uh, false images and so forth. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so um, what um, I'm, I'm going to do now is uh, go to Doration uh, because she talks also about the meeting with the Board of Regents and then we can like say more later on about the Board of Regents uh, action that uh, you folks uh, were at. Yeah. I was really lucky to be a part of that um, meeting where we got to speak to the Board of Regents. Um, we had um, a few student activists as well as um, students directly involved by the policy change who would be directly, um, directly um, affected by the policy change and who would benefit from it. So they were able to speak and testify um, and I was able to tell stories of all the students I had met who would struggle in the movement. And the Board of Regents were very supportive. Um, the Chancellor expressed his support for policies like the DREAM Act in the past. And we were surprised that we had full support. Um, and hopefully, it does proceed from there. But mm -hmm. I feel like our testimonies really helped to get that personal touch and for them to hear how it truly affects the youth um, and how it you know, creates all these obstacles to get that education, which is really the most important thing for anyone to get. So it seems that a lot of them really struggled. Um, a lot of them either choose not to go to college or they take a break and um, end up going to community college um, or it takes them a very long time to finish school because they some, some of them have to finish um, or have to take semesters off so that they can work and pay for tuition because they're not able to access the financial aid. Um, there was a student who testified, Omar, who um, he had to pay out-of-state tuition at KCC, although he grew up in the, on the islands his whole life since the age of two. So that's something that we feel is a broken system, and we feel like it's something that we can change and that hopefully it will change with the Board of Regents' help. It seemed that, I'm not too sure, but it seemed that people in the meeting who were unexposed to the issue before, the students who were testifying about other issues, 
they were at the meeting and heard our testimonies and they really sympathized with us and expressed that they hadn't heard about these issues before and it seemed like they found it really important and th there didn't seem to be any opposition um, in the room that day, in the meeting, and there was mm -hmm. about 20 to 30 people supporting us. Yeah, so um, the, uh, Dore spoke about something important, which is like educating, and that's what, when you go to classes, like what you said, you go to classes and talk to students, uh, or the petition through the petition, or uh, Paul mentioned the classes and the petition as well, and other activities. So it's very important to educate, uh, you know, the public, uh, including the UH public, about that. And uh, that's why when uh, somebody hears uh, all this uh, in uh, general, like all oh, these undocumented, they come here, and they also want uh, resident tuition. That's unfair because these guys. Uh, didn't line up uh, to become documented. So what is this story about? So what I'm going to do now, since I know you are knowledgeable about this, um, put um, on screen uh, a fact sheet about uh, UH tuition at resident rate uh, for undocumented students. And then we don't have to go like, uh, you know, point by point, but uh, in general, uh, try to uh, make uh, the argument that, in fact, uh, it would be of benefit to Hawaii as well as the undocumented students. Uh, uh, it is one thing to uh, hear uh, a couple of stories, anecdotal uh, things about uh, undocumented uh, people, uh, which is very important, but it's one thing. And another thing is that, okay, what's in it for us? I mean, that's the bottom line. I mean, whether we like it or not. So here um, I will put on the screen, uh, what is the UHBOR being asked to do? And so, uh, Carolina, maybe you want to start, and then we go uh, to Ruben as well, and go from one slide to the other uh, as much as we can. So we're asking the BOR to adopt the policy um, to let undocumented students attend um, attend college here. So we are only asking for three requirements, which is that they have attended at least three years of college. I mean, of high school here in Hawaii. Um, that they register with the U with the UH system, which could be the university or any of the community college campuses, and that they file an affidavit saying that they're gonna change their um, their immigration status. Yeah, but that uh, the affidavit that they were going to change their immigration status would uh, presuppose that uh, there is uh, a process in which they can do so without being penalized or like, you know, it's, it's not like a, a net where they catch them and send them back yeah. into wherever, you know, yeah. and that's very important. You want to uh, talk well, yeah, about that? I think um, yeah. we can't discount the kind of larger I guess fear that runs through this process. I mean, um, for a lot of these students, even though they've grown up here and all of that, they they're still kind of on the margins, mm -hmm. right? And and um, when they find out their their status, uh, it must be absolutely terrifying mm -hmm. to then start that process. And um, good. Uh, another uh, slide. I, I'm gonna go uh, in, through a couple of slides. Can undocumented students go? To to UH, of course they can, but they are paying uh, non-resident uh, tuition, so that makes it uh, problematic uh, for uh, for them, especially when they have lived uh, here most of their lives, like you know, yeah. minus two, minus two years, <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah, so that's one. I'm gonna go to the next one. Do any other states provide in-state tuition to undocumented students? So. We have a number of those, right? I mean, you can say a few of those. Um, yeah. yeah, Oklahoma, Rhode Island, for instance. Mm -hmm. You know, Oklahoma, yeah. <laughs> they have it. Texas as well. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's mm -hmm. kind of surprising. <laughs> yeah, and the interesting thing, like people think, oh, it's like Latinos or Hispanics who are gonna benefit from that period, but uh, do we have undocumented who are not Hispanic? Yes, we of do. course. Yeah. yeah. Especially here in Hawaii, yeah. we have um, Filipinos and Chinese who are also can are also undocumented. Yeah, and these are probably the majority yes. of the undocumented. So Definitely. you see, like the stereotype doesn't fit. I mean, and this uh, 
uh, you know, indicates a lack of education about the topic. So it's important for people who are in the know or active about it to educate uh, the rest of us uh, about that, yeah. <clears throat> How many undocumented students will benefit from the BOR policy change? <clears throat> That's uh, another slide that I have. Uh, would you so We're saying that, like, on a good optimistic estimate, it'd be like 300 students, and that is mainly because we are asking that they file an affidavit saying that they will change their immigration status. And I know that'd be kind of hard, like you're saying, you know, we're putting that they're putting themselves out there, they're letting the university know that they're gonna that they are undocumented. So that's why we think that only about 300 students would benefit from this. Yeah. And even though it's like such a small number, not many of them would be benefiting from this. Like, you know, it still gives those 300 people an opportunity to succeed in life. Yeah. And that might be um, the first step, mm -hmm. because uh, if we are arguing that actually society would benefit from this, not only the undocumented, and if they have a process <clears throat> in which uh, uh, or through which they can become uh, documented, then everybody benefits. Mm -hmm. The undocumented who become documented, and they um, uh, contribute to society, and society will be that much richer because yeah. you have more that. And I know what you talk about, uh, uh, not look at them as human capital only, mm -hmm. but they are human yeah, beings, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. And it is important for their uh, psyche, etc., as human beings when they know that uh, society is really, uh, you know, like uh, giving them uh, some kind of reward and uh, uh, really um, consider, uh, considerate of their uh, particular uh, activities and the contributions to society. Yes. Yeah, so that's, uh, I think, an important uh, thing to do. <clears throat> so let's go to uh, the, the other thing with, uh, okay, if you have undocumented students, are they going to displace or take resources from people who were born and raised here, true blue, for instance, mm -hmm. you know. <laughs> so. Uh, no, um, for in many ways, um, the university is always looking and, and looking for more students from Hawaii. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, coming from out of state, it's probably odd that I'm saying that, but uh, no, I mean, uh, there's plenty of room <laughs> at the yeah. university system for more and more. Yeah. Our students. So, don't worry. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and they're not gonna take uh, your uh, <clears throat> also grants and scholarships and all of that. Yeah. <clears throat> so, this is the other one. Will financial assistance and scholarship for Hawaii residents be reduced because of undocumented students? Okay. I, I think uh, this fact sheet like tries to anticipate any kind of objection to it mm -hmm. and say, no, that's not yeah. going to happen. And in fact, society would benefit from that. So that's uh, a very important thing uh, yes. to say. So we can go to another slide, in fact, since we have uh, covered this one. <clears throat> For Native Hawaiian students be impacted because of undocumented students. That's another yeah. no, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, so, and anyway, uh, as Amy said, like Hawaiian community has been welcoming, you know, especially people who uh, understand that particular situation and so forth. Yeah. Um, anyway, so, I mean, uh, we can get back to some of that, but uh, let me uh, say something about uh, uh, in-state tuition when students from other Pacific Islands pay out-of-state tuition. So why should Hawaii's undocumented students qualify for in-state tuition when the other Pacific Islands pay out-of-state tuition? Uh, so any, any? So this is because these undocumented students have been living here all of their life, or most of it at least, and they have gone through at least three years of high school here and have graduated from the high schools in Hawaii. So that's why we think that they should benefit from this. Yeah. Okay, so it's, an, it's a different uh, thing, mm -hmm. completely different or um, largely different from the Pacific Islanders, yeah. Okay, uh, so uh, what I'm going to do now is uh, go to a segment of an interview with Amy Agbayani. And um, <clears throat> she's talking about how she reaches out uh, through programs uh, to uh, 
you know, the community. We actually haven't, but we're reaching out because mm -hmm. I believe they're here, here yeah. somewhere. Right. And so we do have, um, Carolina is helping us mm -hmm. try and outreach mm -hmm. and, and, and support them. Um, but I have many programs in the schools that I think uh, probably already provides mm -hmm. assistance because yeah. they're in the same location. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, it's obvious that many of these um, undocumented families uh, are working class or live in low-income communities. And I have programs in Waipahu, for example, as well as the Leeward Coast um, and, and Kalihi. Mm -hmm. And uh, we think that uh, if we could support them and give them information about college opportunities to Manoa or any of the campuses, we probably are reaching some of these undocumented students. Yeah. I have another uh, program, it's called uh, the Challenge Grant, just started. And it's specifically for um, asking us to uh, help uh, those who, who they call English limited uh, English language learners. So these are children whose uh, native language is not English. And so we have uh, programs to bring them onto campus to tell them about um, admission standards and so forth. And so, um, of course, they're not eligible for finan federal financial aid, but. Um, that's one of the problems that we will work with. So this is a proactive uh, program so that uh, like goes out to the community, to the high schools and try to see who might be undocumented and needs help. Mm -hmm. But also that helps everyone else, uh, you know, that uh, needs help uh, as students and to also come uh, bring them to the university as well from high school. So it's a very important uh, thing for transition from high school to higher education. So she's doing uh, that particular thing. Um, <clears throat> another thing, uh, we talked about uh, stereotyping, we talked about how uh, people might be afraid uh, that, you know, undocumented or immigrants for that matter, uh, not, only un uh, not only the undocumented, uh, but also documented immigrants uh, might take resources from the general population, so to speak. Uh, but in fact, um, one of the things, though, that uh, might influence this, also the question of homeland security and so forth, and so how stereotyping plays and the racial profiling also play into the hands of, um, you know, national uh, homeland security uh, activities so that uh, would discriminate even more in this kind of milieu uh, against uh, people, uh, immigrants, or people who look like they are immigrants. Mm -hmm. I don't know. And in Hawaii, it's very difficult, <laughs> right, to figure that one out. So Monisha has talked about that in a segment of the interview, so you'll watch that. Nationally, one of the things that we have seen is that uh, immigration enforcement in the name of national security uh, has been used as a way to uh, terrorize workers who are organizing, especially organizing for their rights. Uh, so there are several instances of uh, workers who, you know, start to organize who are then, uh, you, you know, found to be undocumented and, uh, you know, uh, fired. Uh, so we, you know, that there is that tendency as well. And one of the interesting things is that the convergence of national security and immigration enforcement after 9-11, this has been a nexus that, you know, is, is very tight right now uh, because uh, we all know that there are no terrorists who are coming in from the U.S.-Mexico border, and yet that is, you know, heavily militarized, heavily policed. Uh, and what we are seeing is that the routine work of, you know, sort of controlling uh, immigrants and their entry into the United States is being done in the name of national security. So, for example, the uh, what is popularly known as the special registration program that targeted men from uh, Muslim majority countries uh, was basically a report to deport program. So people were asked to report for national security purposes 
and when they were found to have irregular immigration uh, status, they were immediately taken into detention and deported, even though they had done nothing that had to do with national security in, the, in, in terms of terrorism or in terms of having serious you know, criminal charges. So it plays out in a small, you know, in a micro level, I guess, this national problem in Hawaii, because we see that the immigrants who are being targeted are not, you know, immigrants with, you know, major sort of criminal records. They don't, you know, uh, the people who are being deported um, uh, do not have the kinds of profiles that are supposed to be the top priority for law enforcement and immigration enforcement. So we know that the administration is using it, that is the Obama administration, is using this to just clean out the country of uh, people who are unfortunately, uh, who don't have papers. Well, it's, it's interesting thing. Um, there's another, um slide here about why should taxpayer money be used to help undocumented persons. Um, for one thing, uh, taxpayer money includes that money that undocumented yes, people are right. uh, using. So, but uh, I just want to read that. Uh, unauthorized persons are estimated to be 4.6% of the workforce. Uh, they contribute $2 billion in economic activity, according to the Perryman Group. Everything is like, you know, uh, uh, documented here, <clears throat> uh, no pun intended. So undocumented immigrants <laughs> pay, uh, and you mentioned that, Carolina, 50.6 million in state and local taxes in 2010, according to data from the Institute for Taxation and Economic Policy. And then they go the breakdown. We don't need uh, to go for the breakdown. But um, it is, uh, you know, something that uh, we need to educate uh, ourselves more about and to educate others about it so that we can all be more or less on the same page and figure out what's going on, what's best for the community as at large. And uh, to have a humanistic uh, approach to this, like not like uh, I am here and you're there, I and you are the other person. So there's difference between us. We have borders or boundaries between us rather than we are all human beings and let's work for the benefit of all. Uh, so that's, uh, you know, a very critical thing uh, to talk about. But um, uh, is there anything else you want to point out, uh, say, from the fact sheet or from your particular uh, activism? Um, I just hope people understand that undocumented people are not these bad people that everybody paints them to be like we like people always say why should we allow immigrants here you know do you want like criminals in this country do you want rapists offenders here but it's like they're painting this image that all immigrants who are coming to this country fit under those categories and that is not true immigrants come here to get a better life just like all immigrants have done so in the past for better opportunity education and to move their family, you know, yeah. in a better, to move them to a better place. So I just hope people understand yeah, that. Right. Um, um, yeah, really. I, I think it's a very simple and straightforward issue. I mean, it's it's taken us five minutes and before classes to get signatures. And if we are understanding that we're getting signatures from the brightest people in the state that are like really struggling, it takes them five minutes to really change their mind and learn about this issue mm -hmm. and, and support it that, you know, it, I think everybody needs to. Right, yeah. yes. and uh, the more uh, we keep educating yeah. people, and maybe at some point we might have a teaching, and even after uh, the question of, uh, you know, the Board of Vision hopefully passing it in November so that they become uh, pay uh, resident tuition, we're going to like have a teaching and talk more about it. Mm -hmm. So we are out of time, and uh, thank you very much uh, for thank coming you. and to discuss this with uh, us. And uh, thank you for the viewers, and mahalo nui loa, see you in November. Thank you. <laughs>